Well, um, hello. As we're fond of saying, good morning to those in the Pacific and Mountain time zone and good afternoon to everyone else. Uh, welcome to the weekly CSCE National Tech Talk 2021 webinar. I'm Mike Bartlett, Chair of the CSCE National History Committee, and I'll be your host for the next hour. It's now approximately 11 in the morning in the Mountain Time Zone, so we'll start this Remembrance Day webinar with a minute or so of silence, please. Thank you. So a word about the CSCE. It's been around since 1887. Our mission uh, is to be a not-for-profit learned society uh, to, created to develop and maintain high standards of civil engineering practice in Canada and to enhance the public image of the civil engineering profession. If you want, uh, find out more at www.csce.ca slash benefits. And uh, with that, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and uh, invite uh, Professor uh, Nicholas Vlahopoulos, Professor of Civil Engineering at Royal Military College in Kingston, to introduce our speakers. Nick, please. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speakers today, especially due to the personal and professional relationships I have with each of them spanning many decades. Uh, their topic is surely of particular interest to me as well. As a 20 plus year Canadian combat engineer veteran myself, the, activity, the activities of the Canadian sappers at Vimy Ridge are truly close to my heart. Dr. Jean Hutchinson is a geological engineer by training as she practiced as an engineer for several years with the Ontario Ministry of Transportation with Clone Crippen Consultants. As an academic, she has been a faculty member at the University of Waterloo and then moved to Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, where she is currently employed. Dr. Hutchinson is a professor in geological sciences and geological engineering, where she specializes in rock engineering, site characterization, and risk management for mining and transportation infrastructure, with a focus on landslide hazards and novel monitoring techniques. She is a registered professional engineer in Ontario and is a fellow of both the Canadian Academy of Engineering and the Engineering Institute of Canada, which speaks how she is revered within professional circles among her peers. Dr. Hutchinson, along with Dr. Diedrichs and several students, were fortunate to be involved in field work at the Vimy Ridge site to access the stability, or to assess rather, the stability uh, of the site prior to the start of restoration works on the memorial, which was completed in 2007. In addition, Dr. Hutchinson was honored to return to Vimy for the 100th anniversary of the battle in 2017. Dr. Diedrichs specializes in underground rock mechanics issues, including damage zone development around tunnels, engineering rock characterization in heterogeneous conditions, and support design issues. He, has, uh, he also has expertise in tunnel uh, excavation challenges in hard brittle rock, soft squeezing ground, brittle fracture, rock bursting, and long-term stability of caverns and shafts as they relate to nuclear waste repositories. He, he, he has contributed engineering research and expertise to complex and challenging projects all over the globe. Dr. Diedrichs obtained his Bachelor of Applied Science and Master's degrees at the University of Toronto and his PhD at the University of Waterloo. His early work involved the development of the geological engineering software to aid in, in underground mining and tunneling, as well as slope stability. From there, he moved to a position as a field micro-seismic engineer at Creighton Mine in Sudbury, Ontario, Canada, and this was in support of a Queen's University Research and Development Initiative. From there, he took on rock mechanics research position within the Geomechanics Research Center in Laurentian University, where he worked on establishing guidelines for ground support design and pursued research related to rock bursts in deep mining. In addition, he has worked in mining and tunneling consultants uh, as a mining and tunneling consultant for the past 30 plus years, 
After completing his PhD in 2000, he joined the Queen's Department of Geological Science and Geological Engineering in 2001, where he is currently employed as a professor. Please join me in welcoming both Dr. Jean Hutchinson and Dr. Mark Diedrichs. Thank you very much for that kind invitation, Dr. Blahopoulos. Um, very much appreciated. Thank you to the Canadian Society for Civil Engineering as well for this wonderful invitation to participate in your webinar series on this most appropriate day. But I'll get started with um, the presentation as we've uh, set out here. The title of the talk is Under the World War I Battlefield, Geotechnical Stability Assessment at the Vimy Ridge Memorial Site in France. And as Dr. Plahopoulos mentioned, both Mark and I were very fortunate to work on this site associated with the restoration of the memorial. And so we'll be talking about some of our experiences there today. Many of you may be aware, but the uh, First World War was fought over a substantial area of terrain uh, running from the North Sea right through down to the German border, uh, French German border in the southeast of this map. The location where much of the fighting occurred is called the Hindenburg Line. And this was a, a line that was very difficult to breach. And you'll see why a little bit later. At Vimy Ridge itself, the French and British had suffered thousands of casualties in previous attempts to take the ridge. The French alone lost 150,000 men in the area around Vimy Ridge in the lead up to the time when the Canadians moved there in early 1916. And you can see some pictures from the time of the war. Uh, the picture in the middle is from the top of the ridge looking down to the terrain below. One of the reasons that the Hindenburg Line was so difficult to breach was that there was a lot of work done from 1914 and on by German geologists. So there was a German military uh, geology organization with 29 teams of geologists, and they were able to take full advantage of knowledge of the terrain and the geology and to use that so that they would have tactical advantage from a natural perspective, from heights of land, from areas that drained better, etc. And we can see on the left side a map of a different area, but from the First War, from these German geological troops. And this is one that describes how water is retained in the subsurface, which is both good from the perspective of a water supply, but bad from the perspective of lack of drainage and difficulty with uh, equipment and people getting very much bogged down in these materials. As a result of their understanding, the German side was also able to build some very strongly fortified concrete reinforced excavations that were much more able to withstand artillery fire as the war went on. The Allied side were, were much more focused on a, a mobile war with cavalry originally and then tanks later on, but they were very much came up against these uh, armaments that were developed by the German side with this knowledge of geology. Vimy Ridge itself was very difficult to take because of the change in height of the terrain. So the picture on the left shows you a section through the earth uh, of the geology in the area around Vimy. And on the left side is Vimy with an offset fault, uh, which makes it rise 60 meters above the surrounding plains. The plains beyond and to the right of this image were very important from an agricultural perspective, an industrial perspective, and there were coal seams located there which were very important for the war effort as well. And in the picture on the top right, you can see the spoil piles off on the very right from those coal mining um, episodes. As I mentioned a moment ago, the German um, troops were very able to take advantage of the terrain. And here you can see a drawing which shows you where the lines were located for the German troops and where the British front line came up against them. You can see that the German troops held the high ground and they also had substantial development of underground um, bunkers and other locations where they could be safe. There were three front lines that the British troops were coming up against all of which had barbed wire, machine gun strong points, and deep dugouts. The picture on the bottom right shows what the Allied troops had to do which was to establish their uh, machine gun locations in shell holes because of the terrain on which they were moving. 
So as I think many of you are aware, for the first time, Canadians fought together under Canadian command during this Battle of Vimy Ridge and triumphed together, which is why a number of people speak of this as sort of the birth of the Canadian nation. This is a very poignant painting from one of the wartime artists uh, at the time of the Battle of Vimy Ridge. One of the reasons that the Canadian and Scottish troops were able to do so well during the Battle of Vimy Ridge was they had months of training. So the picture on the left shows you a scale model that was built of the battlefield with the different trench positions. And on the right side, you see a barrage map, which gives exactly the times that the troops needed to be at diff different positions across the battlefield so that they could advance under protection of a rain of, of uh, artillery fire that was moving ahead of them. So the idea became possible as the war went on as the ability to sight those guns uh, got better and better. The cost of the Battle of Vimy Ridge was substantial. It took four days to take full command of the ground beyond the ridge. In the first wave on the morning of the first battle, 20,000 Canadian and Allied soldiers went out uh, at 5.30 in the morning. But altogether, over those days, 100,000 soldiers were involved from the Allied side. Um, of that, 3,598 Canadian soldiers were killed, 7,000 wounded. And on the German side, it was an estimated 20,000 casualties from this battle and 4,000 prisoners taken. As a result of this, the French government granted 250 acres of land at Vimy Ridge to Canada for perpetual use. And this is where the Canadian uh, National Memorial site is located at Vimy. The sculptor who won the competition to build the memorial was Walter Allward. And he was very affected by the events of the First World War and in the end built an exceptionally beautiful memorial. So if anybody's had a chance to be there, you'll know that. In addition, the War Museum in Ottawa has a number of the maquettes that were designed to, to build this memorial. Of the uh, fighting force of 620,000, 170,000 were wounded, 66,000 dead. And the inscription on the side of the memorial says, to the valor of the countrymen in the Great War and in memory of their 60,000 dead, this monument is raised by the people of Canada. The memorial is, has these incredible sculptures representing a number of the different attributes of peace and justice. And on the right side, you can see the single carving of Mother Canada, who's mourning for the unknown soldier whose tomb rests at the base of the memorial. And inscribed around the base of the memorial are the names of 11,285 11, Canadians who died in France and have no known grave. We became involved at the time when the government decided to uh, start to restore the memorial in preparation for the 90th anniversary commemorative um, festive or, uh, moments. The memorial was degrading. The concrete in the inside of the memorial was releasing calcite, which you can see on the left picture is flowing over the surface of the memorial. And the limestone from which it was built was starting to degrade, as you can see on the right side of the picture. So the work to restore the memorial was, was very important at this time. At the same time, there was a great deal of battlefield subsidence that was going on 80 plus years after the battle. And that's how I initially became involved um, due to my work on ground subsidence. So the picture on the left is actually a failure that was in the path on the lead up to the memorial site. And the kind of things that you see on the right side are the kinds of failures into the subsurface that were happening across this terrain. This was a threat to both the public visiting the site, but also the construction work that you can see on the left side. Large trucks were being driven in to remove um, old limestone and to bring new limestone. And so there was concern that that construction work might create additional failures into the subsurface. So that was the focus of the work that we did there. In addition to the memorial restoration, there are also highways that cross the site. There are parking areas at the various visitors' locations, including the cemeteries and the visitor center, and there are access roads across the surface of the site, all of which had seen subsidence in areas located near them. So we conducted an investigation, and the investigation had these questions. Where might the subsidence occur? Again, 
And so we needed to understand the excavation dimensions, depths, and locations from the First World War. How long would that failure take? We were seeing failures 80 years afterwards. Would this continue on? What were the characteristics of the materials? Voids that would present potential for these failures. Most of the maps of these areas were destroyed in archives, particularly on the German side during the Second World War. So there's very limited information about the maps of the area to know where these various excavations would be located. How deep do we need to look? We were doing some work, which you'll hear about later, using geophysical methods and drilling methods. How deep do we need to drill or use geophysics to understand what might be happening? And will we miss voids that can become unstable in the future? So these are the kinds of questions we were dealing with from the engineering perspective on this site. One of the challenges is that um, this was a war of attrition. As I mentioned near the beginning, the Hindenburg line was very well established and people battled back and forth over the same very small amount of terrain for long periods of time. As a result, you can see in these pictures, the terrain was badly destroyed by all of this. Nothing was left in the way of, of habitation or landmarks. And so going back now and trying to understand what happened, you're trying to interpret terrain that was largely destroyed. And so especially the material working ha in has been bombarded with um, shells throughout this time. So we looked at historical information. We tried to understand what kinds of excavations were built, uh, where they would be located, how deep they might be, and also the, the position that they were within the subsurface and the material that's present there. So as I mentioned, there was very much uh, an established protracted set of battles from um, trench to trench. The picture on the left side is taken from an aerial balloon in this case. And this shows on the right side, the very well developed German trenches with the crenellations um, that are very characteristic of these types of trenches established over the three lines I mentioned earlier. Whereas on the left side, the allied trenches were much less well established because they were still trying to force a more mobile war. As time went on, however, those trenches became more established and the dugouts were, were made deeper because of this recognition that the war wasn't going, or the battles weren't going to move too far from these positions. So you can see on the left side what some of the trenches look like now um, at the Vimy site where they've been restored using the equivalent of sandbags as they would have been during the war. And you can see some pictures um, from the First World War of the similar environment. So when we're looking at the site uh, where the, the First World War surface has been retained, we can get a sense of where the trenches were located. Because you can see on the left picture, you can still see that crenellated characteristic in the ground surface. From those uh, trenches were extended dugouts down into the subsurface and these always faced towards the other side. So we had a sense of if we knew where a trench was, where might be a dugout located. And we can see a picture on this, on this slide of, of a failure into one of those dugouts. The dugouts, as you can see on the right hand picture, were used for everything from sleeping and cooking um, and protection while the troops were at the front line. As the war went on, and one of the things that was challenging to look at from the perspective of subsurface voids was that on the Allied side, the dugouts were made deeper from 1916 and on because they realized that they weren't moving and that artillery shells could in fact uh, extend down to some of the shallower depth dugouts. So if you now imagine that we're trying to, to understand the position of underground excavations, there could be several generations of them at different depths in the subsurface based on this change in the way that they constructed the dugouts. There are also subway tunnels located across these sites. These are larger tunnels that are used for underground troop movement. As you saw on the first slide from the Vimy Ridge um, offset in the fault, the terrain permitted the other side to see completely everything that was happening on the surface. So they built these underground tunnels that the troops could move through, move up to the front line, move back. And in the lead up to some of the battles, they in fact spent the night over in these areas to be prepared to go out onto the battlefield in the morning. This map shows some of those um, tunnels progressing from the bottom of the Allied Trench side across towards the top of this picture. 
And what you see is the map showing the known German tunnels that they were able to establish from mapping and from trench raids that they did. Um, and so the larger tunnels are shown going towards the front line, but then you can see a whole bunch of Y branching smaller tunnels. And these can be as deep as, as 20 to 30 meters below surface. And the objective of these was to get out and underneath the no man's land to set off military mines. So the military mines you can see on the bottom right, this is the type of thing they were doing. They were advancing small tunnels underneath each other, trying to set off these large explosive uh, detonations. In the middle top picture, that's one of the remaining small tunnels that was advanced in this way. And you can see a person in there and all you can see is sort of from the hips to the head of the person. You can see how small these excavations were. Any amount of rock that was moved had to be taken out from the underground. That was a lot of work. In addition, the chalk that was being removed was very visible to the other side. And so they tried as much as possible to minimize how much material they were moving and storing on surface. The military mines could have anywhere from 20,000 pounds to 90,000 pounds of explosives. This is a picture from more recent times by a group called the Durand Group, who are a group of retired military personnel from mostly the UK. And they work on restoring and understanding these First World War excavations. Their name comes from the fact that they found a mine that was not, or a military mine that was not detonated during the First War called the Durand Mine. They found where it was located and they, were, they found that the firing pins were still live. So the left-hand pictures show you um, one of the personnel uh, cutting those wires. And you can see that most of the aminol had leached away into the subsurface because the, the picture on the right would have been full of bags of explosives at the time of the war. The result of these types of, of mines when they were detonated are shown on the right side with an explosion of the Hawthorne mine during the first war on the bottom right picture and the resulting crater that still remains today. And if you're if you visited the Vimy site and you visited the trenches, you'll see the location of those military mine craters between the true front lines. So in order to understand what might happen going forward, we needed to understand the geological model. We needed to understand the, the strength of the material, the fractures that are present in the material. And as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the near surface material was heavily bombarded by all of the artillery shells that were flying uh, during the, these engagements. So to develop a geological model, we visited as many of the underground tunnels as it was safe to do. The left-hand picture is a site that we did not go into because you can see its imminent collapse but there were other locations where we could get underground. We also mapped the chalk on coastal environments, in quarries, and as I said before, we used geophysics and drilling to try and understand the, the geology. One of the significant uh, contributions on the Allied side came from Sir Edgeworth David. He was born in Wales, but spent most of his career in Australia. He was also a decorated explorer of the Antarctic and also enlisted into the First World War effort well beyond the age of permissible conscription normally, but he was essential to understanding what was happening in the geology around these areas, in particular looking again at groundwater and the mineability of the locations. And this is his map from the time of the Vimy Ridge location. So as I mentioned, we use the chalk cliffs of England and France as places to try and understand the, the setting of the geology. And uh, Mark will talk about more about this in a moment, but this is basically millions of years of deposition of microscopic um, sea creatures called coccoliths. The picture on the right side shows the individual rings of each of the coccoliths with their calcium carbonate skeletons. The scale bar there is two microns, if anybody's interested, they're, they're, they're microscopic, tiny little creatures that rain down into the ocean and eventually form the chalk layers that you see in these cliffs exposed in England and France. So we did field investigations on the coast of England near Brighton. We moved across to the coast on France near Alt. We then went inland to some of the quarries that were available near the site. And as I said, we went into as many tunnels as we could around the Vimy area. On the, coastal, uh, the coast of England, we were fortunate to work with Dr. Rory Mortimer, who is an expert in, in chalk in England, and he was able to orient us to these materials. 
And we were able to do the same in France. Uh, and it was lovely working in our gear on the beaches of France. Um, and then, as I said, we mapped in quarries that were exposed and we could understand where we were within these materials. So now I'll turn it over to Mark. Uh, thank you, Jean, and hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the um, geotechnical investigations and the, and the analysis and the hazard assessment that was done in a little more detail. Um, first step was characterizing the chalk, which coming from Canada, we thought would be fairly simple. It's anything but. It's in essentially a very fine grain, weak biogenic limestone, uh, according to the textbooks. Um, it's carbonate, which means it's susceptible to dissolution and uh, it has high porosity, which gives it a sort of a weak and soft texture. However, it's low permeability, which creates uncertainties in, in uh, water flow through and, and uh, weathering. And so, but it covers a vast area um, of, of Europe and many other parts of the world. Jean? Next slide, please. Um, it's low strength, but it uh, can be high strength as well. And there are many, many, many units and layers across the London Paris Basin. Uh, the entire basin, as you can see in the top right, was uh, connected to the same shallow sea uh, through the parts, the later Jurassic and most of the Cretaceous and late Cretaceous. Uh, the, 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 set of, the chalk that we're going to be dealing with on the French side is mostly late Cretaceous, so 100 to 90 million years old. So we're looking at about 10, 10 million years of chalk. Um, however, many, many different layers within that sequence. One of the tools we use, which I, and I never thought I'd use the word engineering paleontologist, but we connected with Rory Mort, um, Mortimer from, from the UK and used very detailed fossil changes to identify individual layers from the fr English coast to the French coast and then inland. And that let us correlate properties uh, through that field investigation. One of the interesting aspects of chalk is the chert beds. And these are uh, silicious units they they occur in layers where there's a redox boundary in the in the chalk in the seawater or they replace sponges and end, uh, that used to be on the sea floor either way it's a it's a it's a two order of magnitude change in strength when you go from the chalk to these chert units and uh, this was interesting for correlations was interesting for our purposes but you can also imagine planning a battle underground where part of that battle requires you to tunnel upwards at a key and critical time and you hit one of these units and your picks are essentially useless. So it's entirely conceivable that these lowly sponges would have changed some of the battlefield outcomes. Here you can see them on the coast of Dieppe. You can see those black lines running through um, the chalk and uh, part of our work was to figure out how these correlated to the rocks at Vimy. And uh, as Dr. Hutchinson said, this part of that work uh, was to look at quarries nearby the site. So now we've moved from the coast into inland. And uh, part of this was to between the rock and the excavations that we're dealing with and the depths. So let's, uh, let's move underground now. So the... Uh, the Duran Group um, had made, uh, has, has done this for dec decades now, and this is how you might encounter one of these military tunnels. This is either a sinkhole in some cases, or this is a shaft that has been filled with clay over 80, 90 years and has now been re-exposed. And this is their first way in. Uh, you can see Phil Robinson on the left, and uh, this once the incredible amount of work involved in pulling all that clay out of the decline, uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, the sandbags and everything, of course, have been installed recently. You can see some of the shallower tunnels in the middle picture. You can see the chert beds with the arrow. Um, this tunnel was probably controlled by those chert beds, whether they intended to excavate at this horizon or not, uh, they really didn't have a choice. And uh, you can see some of the instability that we were dealing with. One of the really, really poignant parts about this uh, tunnel and uh, 
some of this now has been preserved, but we were there um, in these tunnels before uh, there was really any formal preservation works underway. And everywhere within these tunnels, you see graffiti, either from before the Battle of Vimy or this was used as a staging area afterwards. And everywhere there's graffiti. Um, I've put some of the notable ones here. Uh, John Hingy was actually from Kingston. I looked him up in the military archives. He actually survived the war and settled on a farm uh, just east of Kingston. Um, you can also see in the top picture uh, a hundred year old set of hand grenades. Uh, pins in, um, fortunately, um, for now. Um, so there are some interesting aspects uh, in this tunnel. Next one, please. Here is more of those um, graffitis. Uh, mostly, most of them are just identifiers, but there are some very, uh, there's a little bit of poetry, and as you can see on the right, some sculpture. Um, it's unknown whether we, these were pre-battlefield sculpture, sculptures or just done while waiting for the next assignment. It's hard to know, but either way, it's hard not to be moved um, in these tunnels. So um, looking at the different types of excavations in detail, Dr. Hutchinson mentioned declines. This is, this is uh, where you start, and these would have been connected to trenches leading down into the excavations. And of course, a reminder that these declines have been completely cleared of all the clay and mud that was filling them uh, since the war. Um, that was been cleared by the Duran group. Uh, so we had a fairly easy time of at least getting down to the levels. These are the standard tunnel networks. So these would be at very, at very different heights. Um, the standard sort of transport tunnel, walking tunnel, was one meter wide and about two meters tall, just big enough to fit through. And uh, you can see various stages of stability. On the left, uh, this is actually shallowing out into one of the cross tunnels. Um, on the two pictures on the right, slightly larger, different structural influences um, in the tunnels and stability problems. These are, uh, we'll call them the battlefield access tunnels. Uh, wherever they were going for a specific purpose and not a long-term transportation route, these were much shorter tunnels and they were wide enough for two people to pass, but the, the height was rarely more than a meter and certainly never more than one and a half meters. And you can see us scrambling around in there. Um, these again are at various depths. Some of them are very deep, in which case we're not particularly concerned about them, but there were some shallow versions of these. The next scale of opening that we are concerned about were the operational dugouts where some the business of war would have taken place. And these are on the order of three to four meters wide. And again, usually at about a seven to 10 meter depth, although some occurred for various strategic reasons, much shallower than that. These are some of the more interesting um, excavations we uncovered. These are intersections between different Rooms, um, some of these were actually dorms. So they would, for officers, I would assume, um, they would split off and make uh, bunk, bunk rooms or there were just intersections between different tunnels. And these could be quite wide um, in terms of effective span, usually at depth. But this is also a great picture because you can see um, that uh, chert bed, which is not a sponge replacement, that's actually a, an evaporate sort of or a replacement formation, and that would have been extremely difficult to have chipped through. And uh, then you do come across these mine chambers, hopefully not too often. Uh, if you've ever wondered what 100-year-old ANFO, uh, ammonium nitrate fuel oil, looks like, that's, that's what it looks like. And um, that's Phil Robinson eagerly salvaging some bags for the museum um, and dumping the ANFO out onto the floor in the process. But... Uh, this was, uh, these, are, these are some very large openings in this material. Now, the question was, why are they collapsing now? And uh, as Dr. Hutchinson said, the, 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 um, there were a number of surface collapses. However, once we get underneath the ground, you can see that there are many imminent uh, stability issues, not just the ones that have made their way to surface, but the ones that could make their way to surface in the very near future. So step one was to understand that there are very many different failure mechanisms. So one size doesn't fit all. Um, you can see beam failure, but you can actually see the beams on the ground in, this, in the left-hand picture, the, the slabs that have, this is a no tension slab, so we know that there's vertical joints. And um, 
the beam can be self-supporting if, if there's enough rigid abutments. But if, it, if there isn't, and of course we have weathering and uh, some groundwater flow eating away at the fractures that make these beds, which is one of the reasons you have the delayed failure. If you have structure, I think in the middle picture, if you look closely uh, above uh, our student Maureen's head there, you can see some inclined structures creating uh, unstable blocks that can gradually unravel. And then throughout there was effectively karst that was filled with clay or not. And these um, could have been very problematic. Remember that the groundwater flow has been completely changed by these tunnels. And so now you have active flow, not, not high flow, but flow of oxygenated water down into these areas, creating a lot more alteration than you would have had in weathering than you would have had before. Tip, some more typical rock mass instability that we encountered in the various tunnels. Most of, the, most of these are perhaps stable for now, probably not stable for another hundred years, but the, the, rocks that, the, the rock units that were next to the tunnel certainly have given way and now whatever agents were acting on them are now acting on the roof above. So some of these will definitely cave to surface at some point. Um, this is Phil Robinson. Keeping up with him in these tunnels was really quite, uh, quite humbling. Um, that's his feet disappearing into uh, an unknown uh, part of the tunnel, which is clearly failed where I'm standing. So we're not quite sure what's happening farther up. Um, but there you can see more of that raveling. And even in the right tunnel, which is one of those more stable subway tunnels, you can see the uh, small block, block by block raveling failure modes taking place. These were one of the more concerning things. These are, these is, this is slab or block failure leading up to what we call the bell chamber, which becomes semi-stable. But in the right-hand picture, you can see the acts of weathering on some of the structures. And so that weathering removes material, removes confinement to this no tension beam, and eventually the slab will fail and then the cycle will repeat itself. And so this is part of this delayed failure mechanism. And of course, chalk is not chalk, as we learned. Um, there's nodular chalk, which is quite soft and, and uh, that's fairly routine. Marl, which is a mixture of silt and clay and chalk and have all sorts of variable properties. And then where the chalk has been silicified in, a little bit, in some ways, you can have hard ground. And so the strength can increase by an order of magnitude quite suddenly. At the coast, it's very clear to see the structure. So after these chalk beds were deposited in the late Cretaceous 100 million years ago or so, there were several episodes of tectonics um, affected by various global events, uh, the, the formation of the Alps to the south, for example. And there are joints that are orthogonal to the beds, so perpendicular, you can see in this picture. And because of some relaxation events, you can see some shear joints um, these are actually um, extension shear joints where the ground has been relaxed by tectonics, pulled apart momentarily, and these large continuous fractures have formed. And because they're in extension, they've also filled with various other minerals, soft minerals. So these can be very problematic. And looking in detail at the quarry, uh, the first pass for analysis was to use the European classification for chalk, which you can see in the left-hand side, it goes from A's, which are very solid intact chalk, up into C's, which are very difficult to work with. And then D would be the weathered gravel surface, basically. And what we had to do was then convert that to geomechanics classification on the right, which is using the geological strength index. And to make a long story short, it's a function of blockiness and discontinuity and joint and fracture quality. And the, this, this chart gives you a number which is then used to factor laboratory test strength to a field value. And you can see the equivalences there. The first one is, uh, no, it's good, Gene. Next one, please. The, the highest quality tunnels are that lovely, perfect chalk with, at depth with very little environmental impacts. In this picture uh, on the right, you can see all of the rotten timbers on the floor that have fallen out, those would have been put there for various reasons at some point. They're long gone, but the chalk is quite stable. And so that gets a very high number on the GSI scale. Coming down into the Bs, this is that tunnel I showed you before with the, the rock mass degradation, the alteration. Um, and that fits in around uh, 
this is being a little conservative, but around GSI 40. Next one, please. And uh, here's Gene um, trying to come to grips with a, a GSI 25 to 30 highly dif disturbed rock. This is a bit cheating. This is really just, this is actually clay that has come down and mixed in with the chalk and filled in a void. The tunnelers have tunneled past it, as you can see on the left. And uh, the Durang group has actually put up some of these temporary supports, but um, trying to understand how this affects the rock at surface. So next step then is to convert that into some modeling parameters. And this is fair, this is uh, decades old or decade and a half old now, I guess, uh, this modeling. So it's, uh, it's what we used at the time. This is finite element modeling, and you can see we've tried to discretize the rock as best we can for different scenarios. This particular one correlates with the core you saw earlier, and the material properties correlate with the GSI system. And we modeled different sizes of openings at different depths. We did have some, um, some property changes. We have the initial conditions as we would have assessed them in a sort of environment when the tunnel was first excavated. Uh, we would then consider weathered conditions, which involve a weakening um, and uh, increase in, in uh, sort of alteration products on the joints, et cetera. So you would end up with a lower GSI for the weathered conditions. And then to simulate the fallout, so some of, this, some of these blocks would simply move, others would collapse. To simulate the fallout of blocks, we reduce the strength of the failed material to zero and uh, ask the question, if this fails, would it cave to surface? And uh, here's one example of the subway tunnels, looking strictly at what depths, at what depths in this environment do these particular tunnels become unstable. And you can see the horizon here is around four and a half meters roof to, roof to surface before we start to see any serious impacts. And in fact, uh, for initial conditions, really the tunnels were stable for quite some time at around two and a half meters, although weathering would have taken its toll. Here's, some, here's what that weathering looks like. You, even if these are hairline fractures in the chalk, you can see the, the alteration products um, working away. This might be a little bit of a Marley chalk, so you're getting clay products forming. And these are the wider dugouts. And here you can see we're at about six meters depth. The initial conditions, of course, would have been fine. These were excavated. Um, with groundwater flow into the tunnels, the weathering products um, take that down so that we're seeing instability. Now, if that yielding, moving, softening rock actually collapses, even at this depth, it is, potent, it is possible for these, um, if this, if this uh, dugout is close to the B quality chalk, it's possible to instigate a surface failure. If it's deeper, then it's less likely. And here you can see that um, this is depth, and then we allow long-term degradation from initial conditions to long-term conditions. And we were able to establish that about seven meters for these three to four meter wide openings uh, gave enough cover within the A quality chalk that these will probably not fail for any, any time in the near future. Anything shallower than that, then there was a, there was a hazard of, of collapse since they were constructed. We looked at other models as well, including this one. This is a model that uh, it looks at the stability of this no tension beam. So no tension is allowed, so the beam is not initially at equilibrium. It actually has to deflect to generate a compression arch. And uh, we looked at various scenarios and spans to look at what critical thickness of beam in the roof from the bedding of the chalk was critical. And it's not just one beam we're interested in because if one beam falls, then the next one falls and then the next one falls. And here you can see very clearly, this is looking straight up into the roof, this progressive beam collapse as you move up into the roof and start the process of ultimate caving. Some of these will self-stabilize um, in sort of a Roman arch uh, type of idea, and others potentially, depending on what's immediately above this, will, could cave to surface. And these models were calibrated from stable cases of different dimensions, unstable cases, as you see on the left, and failed cases as you can see on the right, this particular cave to surface happened behind one of the old warden's cabins on the park. And what you're seeing there are uh, 
uh, spirit bottles that uh, the wardens would have pitched out into the into the uh, sinkhole behind their cabin over a few decades, and they've made their way down into the tunnels. So the results of this modeling, I won't read this slide in detail, but this is essentially a hazard map of tunnel width, time, and depth, and looking at this, what, uh, at what depth would tunnels of certain sizes be a problem? At what depth would they have already failed long before the present, in which case they were no longer a hazard? At what depth would they be completely stable and no longer a problem? And uh, that's a function of span and depth, of course. And the conclusion was that uh, for medium probability of, of delayed failure, Two and a half to three and a half meter depth for the tunnels, three and a half to four and a half meter depth for the intersections was probably okay. Anything significantly more than that was a, was a, was a potential, and anything less than that was a high probability of caving. Um, for these larger three three by two meter and larger openings, um, six and a half to eight meters depth was potentially an issue. Uh, three to four meters depth, they probably already have failed, and then. Um, you can go from there. And so that was, the, that was the purpose and the result of the modeling. Back to Jean. Thank you. So all of that modeling and work uh, was helpful in terms of trying to figure out what to do on the site, including this work, which used a variety of geophysical tools to visualize the subsurface. And so we used a, a variety of tools that, that permit us to look at the characteristics. And the map in the middle shows in pale blue the sections of the terrain in front of the memorial, which are likely to be uh, that degraded category D chalk that Mark was just talking about. And so this is the location over which the trucks would drive to do the restoration work. And so in the end, uh, they decided to put some large steel plates across the terrain just to spread the, the load of those trucks driving across the surface. We also did some drilling at the site so we could confirm the depths to these different layers. And we used a variety of different cross hole and, and down hole geophysics methods to characterize these materials as well to understand their strength. But the modeling that Mark talked about was very useful to tell us the kind of depths we needed to get to. So he also mentioned at the beginning uh, the challenge of the church and you can see the drill that came from England to do the work. This drill uh, was very much uh, had trouble with, with a lot of those uh, chert layers breaking off various bits of the drill. So unfortunately, the program also really didn't consider those things that we'd known about for some time uh, in the past. The actions taken at the site were that any time from that point forward where there was a subsidence event, the parks personnel would record it on the kind of form you see in the middle so we could start to understand where these were forming going forward. The areas were fenced, the sources of subsidence were assessed, and then thinking about what should be done next was done. It's always important to remember working on this site, the commemorative nature of the ground. And so things that we might as engineers normally do was sometimes challenged by the fact that we were dealing with commemorative ground and a lot of work to change the ground couldn't be done. The site was rededicated in April of 2007. You can see these pictures from that. And as I said, I was very fortunate to be at the site on the 100th anniversary in April 2017. And this is the moment when the First World War aircraft are doing a flyby of the, the site during that memorial. One of the things that really struck me in the 100th anniversary was of the 25,000 people who were given access to the site on that day, 12,000 of them were high school students. And I think that was an essential part of the commemorative nature of our historical memory going forward. It was a remarkably poignant day to be there. Um, the project team comprised uh, both Dr. Diedrichs and myself, uh, a postdoctoral student, Dr. Catherine Reed, who's now in New Zealand, Maureen Matthew, who's now a PhD student at Dalhousie, Dr. Peter Peme, uh, who did the geophysics work, as, as Dr. Diedrichs has mentioned, Philip Robinson, and Dr. Mortimer from Bristol University. But thank you very much for your attention and for this opportunity today. Great, thank you. CSCE is grateful for our uh, corporate partners. Here are some of them. And here are some more of them. Jean and Mark, I did want to say thank you very much for uh, an excellent presentation and great answers to questions. 
uh, we reached out to our colleagues at RMC about a to suggest a suitable Remembrance Day uh, topic and they immediately and enthusiastically uh, told us about you and it's easy to see why. So thanks to Nicholas and Gord Wright for this excellent suggestion and thanks again to the two of you for just a wonderful job. <laughs>